What's up, you cheeky scamp? It's your boy Jack Slack, Fights Gone By podcast. That's my full name. And today we're going to be talking about uh, the fights that happened over the weekend, which you may or may not be interested in. I feel like this could be a good episode because there's a lot to moan about, but also one of our least listened to episodes because, you know, that that card. <laughs> um, I mean, we all knew up front this was going to be a bad card because you don't lead with your worst fight. You, you lead with what you presume is going to be your best fight as in have it as the main event and the main event was i versus calvillo which is probably one of the worst main events on paper in ufc history and then one of the worst main events in actuality in ufc history but i mean i i could be a snarky fucker which i'm sure many of you tuned in for uh but i thought it might be actually be like interesting to be helpful about this you know to to uh it's one thing for me to be like oh it's shit tier poop tier garbage uh, but, you know, use your words, Jack. Tell us why it's shit, tear, poop, tear, gar- garbage. Um, and uh, I think I will. Uh, if, let's I mean, let's talk about some of the issues with this fight, because I feel like some of the issues with this fight are why women's MMA in general is bad. Like, and uh, not all women's MMA. You know, I will sit down and watch a Rose Nami Yunus fight over many men's MMA fights. And we're not even including, like women's MMA fighters who I don't particularly enjoy watching but who are good like Valentina Shevchenko I'm talking specifically about what it is you know when I and Cavillo came out for this fight it fell into this pace and you were like oh yeah that's that's pretty standard women's MMA pace and and that's a, a women's MMA type of fight and that's why you get all these people on forums being like women's MMA is garbage I hate women's MMA why are we giving women time on the card uh, I'm not going to go that far, obviously, because there's a lot of uh, women's MMA that I do enjoy, or some women's MMA that I do enjoy. But I think, you know, sitting there and forcing myself to watch this fight, even after I got bored, um, and, and asking why it was annoying me so much, it really sort of brought to light some of the bigger problems in women's MMA, which we've been talking about for a little while. Um, but I thought it might be fun to just look at them as a whole. And I think one of them. Well, I'll take you back to, I can't remember who Jessica I was fighting, but it was a dog shit event and I had to talk about Jessica I. And I went and watched her fights and I was like, do you know what? She doesn't have a bad jab, that Jessica I. But the thing that I did pick up on was that she'd jab, land her jab, and then if the opponent continued throwing after her jab, they'd hit her in the head. So she, like Misha Tate did it and countless others at Bantamweight, but she'd land the jab as they stepped in and then they'd hit her with a right hand and actually hurt her, which the jab wasn't doing. Um... And then, you know, the more I watch of her, the more I realise that, no, she doesn't have a good jab. She just jabs when the opponent steps in a lot of the time. And what you got in this fight with Calvillo, large portions of it were, well, seemed back and forth because Calvillo would step in with her head on, on the centre line and eat the jab. And you go, damn, Jessica's establishing the jab. And then she'd duck in and, like, swing a crazy overhand left or right. And the jab would miss and she'd hit I because I would just be there for it. Uh, and, and, like, they alternated back and forth, but it wasn't because one of them worked the other out. They were just, like, accidentally finding each other. Two of the big issues with MMS, women's MMA and why this fight felt so bad and why a lot of women's MMA fights feel so bad on the feet was that they stand in front of... Well, they circle firstly, and then they adopt their stance and stand at exactly the distance that you would from your pad man, and then they try and throw three punches... And it, they completely disregard what the other person is throwing back. And they completely disregard how the other person is going to react. So it just, it loses this alive element. Because you could be, you can actually be pretty shitty looking on the pads or the mitts or, you know, on the heavy bag or whatever, but catch a lot of people out. Because when when you're talking about actually fighting, that's a game of, anticipation and expectations and working with people's expectations faking them out fainting them uh you know going high going low you know it's one of the best high kick setups in the world is to look down you know and that's not high level technique that's just if you can do that convincingly and that's body language that's you know working out what your opponent's expecting that's establishing a low kick and then you just give them a little look down and kick them in the head and that will score you more knockouts than being able to pump hands very fast and i think one of the huge problems with women's mma generally is what happened with ronda rousey ronda rousey looked great on the pads and then when you actually watched her on the pads with edmund he's standing in front of her feeding her the punches meeting her halfway 
and never throwing anything back unless it's like pre-agreed upon um and uh, and never moving like what they do is they go throw an eight punch combo bam 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 quick look to camera he steps around and pivots around behind her then she turns around or whatever re-establishes her stance and then they go again and that was how all her fights went because as soon as someone started moving from side to side she couldn't hit him and that was what i got overwhelmingly in this i versus cavillo fight both of them really struggled with moving their feet with their punches and basically if they weren't in the exchange agreeing to both be there while they tried to throw their punches as fast as they could uh, both had real trouble getting to each other and i think you know another thing about this is that i don't know what it is that is happening in women's mma that so many of them fight in this way where they look like they're just standing in front of their pad man but i think the lack of power coming back really plays into this if you're shit scared of what's coming back you can't just stand there and throw three punches and then end with a right straight which is what jessica i did in every exchange um uh, you know she we talk a lot about like closing the door you throw you know one two and then three to close the door or one two jab back close the door or one two get down behind your shoulder and turn away you know there's a lot of ways to close the door but it's to get you back behind your lead shoulder and into your stance and blade it um or at least more bladed than you are when you're square throwing the right hand but you know there were large periods of this fight where they'd throw three punches at each other at the same time one of them would come out on top and then jessica and i would have her head up in the air her eyes closed and she'd throw the right straight on the end and her corner were like just keep throwing you know just just keep trying to land the last punch in the exchange there was always this feeling that the fight never went beyond the exchange that was happening you know if you watch i, I mean this is ridiculous to sublime but if you watch julio cesar chavez you know uh when he throws a punching combination he's then moving in and moving his head and he's looking to start the next punching combination you know uh, watch him against uh, hector camacho that's an amazing fight because hector camacho is really good at getting away from people and staying off the ropes and uh julio cesar chavez is walking him down he'll throw a combination move his head and then he's already getting up in camacho's face for the next combination while also looking after himself you know whereas i feel like a lot of these fights in women's MMA, and especially this one, you know, we're, we're talking mainly about this one because it was so bad. It's like, one, two, three, we both throw at the same time, take a breather, <laughs> maybe circle a step or two, and then re-establish stance and get back into that range where we're comfortably working with our pad man. There's no building from one exchange to, the, to another. Each exchange is like an episode in a TV show, and everything's back to normal at the end of the episode, no matter what wacky shenanigans happen in the exchange. I mean, you can add to that, like, the bad ring craft and bad strike selection that was on display throughout. I mean, Jessica Rye's corner asked for kicks. She immediately backed Calvillo up onto the fence and stepped in and threw a step up. I think it was a step up left low kick and uh, immediately got taken down off that. And then a corner were just like, no more kicks in the next round. <laughs> You're like, well, you have to own some of that, I suppose, as the corner. You know, that's not all on her. She did what you asked her to. Uh, she did it in a, in a way that basically put her on top of the opponent. But um... And then there was another one where she sprawled on a takedown attempt by Cavillo, because these were not good takedown attempts by and large. Uh, she sprawled on a takedown attempt from miles out. And then she came up on like a front headlock and they're both sort of standing up. And she throws the knee and then gets taken down because she gave Calvillo her knee. You know, it was uh, really shoddy stuff generally. But And then there was like the, the ground game stuff was particularly odd because Jessica and I would just... I mean, it just showed you the, the, the floor in the knee shield, which we talk about a lot. You know, the knee shield, there are amazing exponents of it, like the low knee shield. Like um, Craig Jones is probably the most notable one in the world right now you know he plays a lonely shield and he does it really well and he uses it to set up his leg entries but in mma there's a, like an epidemic of people playing the lonely shield and then being surprised when they can neither get up nor keep the opponent from sprawling on them nor actually stop them from striking and every time jessica i got taken down she went low knee shield and uh calvillo would put in the arm weave you know over the top leg and I'm um, sorry, uh, around the top leg and over the bottom leg so that you can't like scissor your legs or, or start to get back to a full guard. And uh, that was your grappling. You know, they were stuck there for a while. And then Jessica Rye would turn her back somehow and give up her back and then, you know, maybe turn back into closed guard at some point. I mean, it was a very bad fight. And part of that was Jessica Rye coming in overweight. Um, I don't want to get into like handbags at dawn, which is what her and Jojo Calderwood were. 
And you're like, girls, doesn't matter. No one cares about this division. But um, you know, Jojo Calderwood was saying she was four pounds over and then suddenly only half a pound over or quarter pound over or whatever it was uh, come fight time. So there were accus- accusations of tailgate. But yeah, I mean, like when this weigh-in was going on, her and Ro- uh, Robeson missed weight and it was really bad. And you're like, why? What do, are either of these fights really necessary? You know, no one's clamoring for them. Mind you, the Vittori versus Robeson fight was actually pretty good. But, you know, when you... Uh, sorry, to take us back to, like, women's MMA and my thought-out rant about women's MMA, I don't want to just... You know, people get mad if you just say women's MMA is bad, but I'm trying to tell you why a lot of women's MMA is bad uh, from my perspective, you know, when I'm looking at it and going, okay, so why is this bad? But, you know, when you look at, say... Rose Namajunas or uh, Valentina Shevchenko or someone like that. The difference is often understanding the distance. You know, the distance in this one was like, we're either out at long range and then we shuffle towards each other, get ready, bite our mouthpieces, and then we throw our punches as fast as we can. Whereas, you know, a Rose Namajunas or a uh, Joanna J. I mean, Joanna jo- jo- Jacek has her own issues with range. You know, she really likes an opponent to be coming towards her. But... Rose Namajunas, really good at uh, affecting range constantly, you know, being in and out of range, making you think she's not stepping in as far as she is, making you think she's stepping in for real and then not. You know, that that is what separates really good striking from, you know, just shit-tier normal striking. Valentina Shevchenko, her whole game is being on the end of people's range. And, you know, when I was saying these girls can't seem to move their feet and punch or move their feet and strike or, or eat up ground and make progress that's what they used to say in driving tests you say you 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 could fail for not making progress because if you just drove really slowly um but the you know they're not making progress towards each other with the strike so if either of them backs out of the exchange they lose it but valentina shevchenko has made a, a killing in women's divisions by chilling out on the end of people's range pulling away when they lunge at her and coming back you know if you watch the i shevchenko fight and you're not just there going for she's gonna head kick her in a minute and and wanking yourself cross-eyed um you'll notice that valentina sets herself up on the end of range every time jessica Rye steps in with a right straight and then oversteps herself and throws like a right swing on the end of it so she's doubling up the right hand but really sloppily and over committing and valentina just just circles off lets her turn to face her and kicks her in the ribs every time you know valentina's known as a pretty good counter puncher you know she uses the the uh check hook a lot you know, she uses it a lot at the air too, but, um, you know, she's a good counterpuncher and she's not fucking about like agreeing to these exchanges. We're going to shuffle towards each other. We're going to set up our stances and then we're both going to throw three punches as fast as we can and then back out of the exchange again. You know, Valentina very much decides when the exchanges happen and when she's piecing out and leaving, you know? And, you know, combined with some guy simping for michelle waterson the other day on twitter go check out the video i replied to him with um i i'm at the point where i'm like i I almost need to do something on valentina and rose and joanna just to show what good striking at women in women's divisions is you know having something building from one exchange to the next making it trevor whitman was talking on the joe rogan's podcast the other week about getting good positions and edging around by those positions alone while looking to build better strikes and setups from those positions you know whereas every exchange in this fight was just like forget what happened in the last exchange we're doing this exchange now i hate to keep banging on the nami Yunus drum she's she's such a great example of someone who was a goofy ass striker who could throw sidekicks and stuff so she did that to someone who actually learned to use distance and uh, you know man- manipulate her opponent's expectations so well, you know that fight with that fight with Joanna, the first one, uh, she gets her because she keeps l- coming in with jabs, surprising Joanna as she comes in, and then goes around the side with the left hook and drops her. That's building from one exchange to the next or one engagement. You know, ideally you don't even want to be exchanging. So if you're wondering why I'm so down on a lot of women's MMA, it's because that's what I see when I watch a lot of the fights. One exchange into the next doesn't matter. And a lot of that might be to do with punching power because you'll notice that I wasn't listing uh, Amanda Nunes as an amazing striker there. She's good. Um, But a lot of what makes her so special is that she can hit really hard. And it's such an advantage in those women's divisions to actually be able to hit with some power. Now people are going to take the, the clips of this podcast out of context and say that I'm arguing that uh, Valentina is actually better than Nunes when you consider all things and their weight and the power and stuff. Which, in honesty, I probably do. But let's 
I think it's been too long now since I, since I've said something. Just we're getting to the limit of my being able to talk seriously and uh, sincerely about something without shitting on a fan base. So, um, oh, I mean, we could touch on one and how they've gone absolutely bro- well. They're 120 million in the hole now. I've been saying 100 million because that was my guesstimate on how badly they were in the hole last time they filed their um, financials. But they're now 120 in the hole, or they were in 2018. Fucking hell. I did say I'd have a good rant about that today, but I might hold off on that. But anyway, women's MMA, that, that is why a lot of it tends to be bad, you know. Um, and there were a couple of other fights on this card, you know, a uh, couple of other women's fights. Well, to be honest, people were going mad about the early finishes in some of these fights. Can we just talk about the card as a whole for a second? Did you get the feeling that most of the big wins were established UFC guy in great shape versus last minute replacement? Because uh, that's what I got from Tyson Nam versus Zarek Adashev, who had about four fights. Uh, and Tyson Nam has been around forever, fighting forever. And Tyson Nam's absolutely jacked. And this Adashev guy is just heavyweight body on uh, bantamweight frame or whatever someone said to me this week. Then you had Mirab Val- Valishvili, who is good. I believe I said that last time I saw him fight. But, you know, legit guy, been in the UFC a while, trains with uh, Sterling and um, Aya Quinter and people like that down at Lo- uh, Cerro Longo. But he was fighting Gustavo Lopez, who, again, pudgy guy and uh, last-minute replacement and also was like, I'm the guillotine guy. And if, anytime the commentators are selling you on a fighter's guillotine against a good wrestler, you just go, oh, this guy's going to lose 30-25 or 30-26 or something like that. You know, he's just going to keep grabbing the guillotine as he's taken down and then there'll be a minute on the ground where he's like does he have it does he oh no he's not got it his head's out now we're now we're playing guard again and just getting smashed and then i think it was um anthony ivy was the last minute replacement against christian aguilera and he just got smoked too um but yeah you had some weird ones on this uh people were mad people were going crazy because there were three good finishes on the prelims um you had tyson nam starching his man which was pretty cool you had julia avila 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 knocking out Gina Mazzani and that was the one that was literally just a girl windmilling at another girl and <laughs> some guy being like so, well there were two of these actually because I had some guy be like did you see how good that girl looked and I was like did you mean the one who windmilled in the first 10 seconds or the one who was fighting a girl half her size because Hannah Siffers who was fighting at like straw weight fighting a flyweight against Maria Agapova just got murdered you know <laughs> she was about half the size of this other girl um but, I mean, to- good stuff on this card, because there were a couple of good things on this card. Um, Jordan Espinosa versus Mark De La Rosa. Good rhyme. Uh, got got a good amount from this fight. I mean, when you were watching it, Jordan Espinosa, really good jab. Um, really liked that. Good takedown defense. And also, like, even though he was winning the stand-up, he knew the other guy just wanted to get the takedown. So he was doing things like he'd duck in on a reactive double, um, or... At the start of the third round, he comes out and immediately pushes De La Rosa to the fence because he knows that De La Rosa is going to try and do the same to him. But really good work throughout, just w- striking from a mobile base as De La Rosa was following him around the ring. If I did have to pick up on some habits of his, you know, that were very obvious as the fight progressed, uh, he can only circle to his left from orthodox, and when he wants to circle to his right, he switches to southpaw. If you, <laughs> you'll have a good, you'll have a good time if you rewatch the fight and look out for that because every exchange he circles left. And then when he wants to go to his right, he changes to southpaw first, and he tends to show you it for a while before he does. But really, what let De La Rosa down here was that he just couldn't cut the cage at all. You know, he was uh, he was basically following him for the entire fight, and Espinosa would spring in, jab him on the snout, and then go back to his left, which is back towards, or that's retreating to the right away from De La Rosa. And that's when De La Rosa should have been stepping deep, throwing the low kick, or stepping deep, shifting, throwing the right hook. You know, there are several weapons you can use to try and catch the guy or or at least catch up to the guy and make it ugly as he's doing that v-step out to his left but um yeah didn't have the tools i say tools you know a lot of it is just get your head get your chin down take the jab on the face and step in and try and low kick him but yeah excited for espinoza's future uh looks like a promising fighter not sure how uh we got two 30 27s because i think you could have given one of those rounds 30 uh 10 8 um maybe more in fact, the first round was one of the few times I've seen someone get consistently beaten up while pushing the opponent to the fence with their head in the, you know, head in the hips, 
looking for the double leg because he just st- stayed there and got elbowed loads. You know, normally that's like a quick thing and there's either a finish or the guy moves his head but just stayed there and got beaten up. Still, respect to De La Rosa because he was mad tough. And I think, you know, better game plan. Also, like a lot of these, I'm not sure if he's last minute replacement or if, when that fight was put together, but a lot of these aren't under ideal circumstances. We were saying this before Tony Ferguson versus Justin Gaethje, and of course everyone's going to forget it, but um, I think like any fight in this period, you've got to treat with like an asterisk because it, it's not a great time for any of these guys to be fighting. It's more for our entertainment than it is for the actual need of the sport. You know, it doesn't really help anyone learn who's better than who than anyone else, you know, in a, a, a pandemic matchup where guys aren't training with all their training partners they aren't able to get all their coaches where they need to be and uh, it's all just very complicated marvin vittori versus carl Re- uh, reverse and marvin vittori i mean he's he is i, I said that he looks like uh the, an aryan super soldier just as the program of breeding aryan super soldiers was starting to have problems with the intelligence stuff but the bodies were still rocking um because he well, yeah anytime you hear him talk you're like fucking hell and then when he won he could only make arnold sounds he's like Argh! but good for him he looked good here uh i know he's had some trouble because he had the failed drug test got very angry about that and i think it was deemed tainted supplement or something like that but he was off for a good while because of that he believes that he won the fight with israel adesanya and he also like back at the start of this trying to get fights going he was one of the people being like lynch bloody elbow coronavirus is an overblown non-issue and you're like you're italian how are you not understanding that it is an issue however he did look good in this fight and again you got to see that um we talked about it with gilbert burns versus tyron woodley but reberson doing an underhook get up from half guard along the fence and you're just like if you're not up on the hand and your your head's not high and you're not getting up with your head high and you know post locked posted arm if you're just up on the elbow you are there for the guillotine the guy can attempt it um it's kind of tricky because he does you know he either has to roll with it and give up position or try and back out of your half guard while he's doing it or let you stand into a front headlock but vittorio was able to go over the head and really effectively threaten the the um guillotine from the uh, top of half guard and robertson's answer was to do the e honda headbutt (laughs) he put his feet on the cage behind him and dived forwards and almost spiked himself which is super dangerous i mean in brazilian jiu-jitsu one of the first things that's outlawed until you're like i think it's blue belt purple belt whatever but they don't even let you do single legs with your head on the outside because so many dudes grab gu- uh, guillotines sat back and the guy who was doing the, the the uh the high crotch head outside single whatever you want to call it spiked his head into the ground and hurt himself the old jake the snake ddt but it was cool and then Robertson just got sort of beaten up, turned his back and, and uh, choked by Vittori. I thought Vittori looked good. Vittori looked like a guy who's been in shape to fight for a while and is looking after himself and staying in the shape to fight for a while. Robertson, having like not been able to do the fight a few weeks ago because of the safety of his weight cut, still managed to miss weight. They had this up at 190. You know, it's a 185 fight. But I mean, after all that fucking around and then also coming in overweight here, I'm pretty happy for Marvin Vittori that... Uh, that he won this one it would it, it would suck if he got asked around the first time then reverse and missed weight by that much and then you know you had that thing where the guy well think like um Oliveira coming in like 10 pounds heavy against will brooks and they're just manhandling him <laughs> you know, you're like i don't think you missed weight because you were trying really hard and couldn't make it i think you missed weight because you didn't try and you wanted to be huge give up 20 percent of your purse just to batter someone Mind you, I missed weight and she looked dreadful on the screen. It's so uncomfortable. It's so uncomfortable. You know, it's such a terrible look for your sport too when you've got these people on the scale shaking and crying and looking like they're about to pass out. You know, we all remember the Aspen Lad one was incredibly uncomfortable. And I, it, I'm going to say that it probably does help that it's women for, for some people watching this stuff. But I, I always used to feel really... Well, you know, when Aldo weighed in at Bantamweight, he looked fucking terrible. When Conor McGregor looked like he'd been sleeping rough for weeks when he weighed in, it was very uncomfortable. Because that, we're at, you know, we've been at this point for a while where we're like, if there is going to be a death in the UFC, it'll be mainly to do with the scale, probably. That's where a lot of the deaths in MMA have happened. I did catch a couple of people, though, in the uh, re- in the replies to the weigh-in video of, of I being like, they need to do what 1FC did. <laughs> like, they don't do anything. They've not proved anything. They're just lying like they always do. In fact, after the uh, One Financials came out, 
this week. Well, they didn't come out this week. They held them for like a year. They were supposed to release them 60 days after their annual general meeting and they released them a year after their annual general meeting. Um, but after Bloody Elbow published that, Ch- Chattery immediately was like, we have nine figures in cash and I'm very proud to announce we've just cut 20% of our stuff. <laughs> Chattery, he's got to try so hard. I mean, he genuinely does love fights because he used to follow me on twitter ages ago you know because because of stuff i'd written about fights and then i mocked him too much about one and he blocked me and then the other day someone tweeted me something of his and i was like chattery's unblocked me (laughs) why would you go back and click unblock unless you're secretly a jack slack fan so if you're listening chattery i like you i just think you're hilarious actually having said that when i was trying to explain one fc to my brother (laughs) <laughs> I was going, so there's this promotion and they pay the fighters or they advertise paying the fighters millions of dollars uh, and they get in tons of money from Singaporean fail sons who are just like, I'm a venture capitalist because I've got my dad's money. Uh, and they put it into a pit, pit in the ground and they put on great shows and great fights, but they don't have any way of actually making money. And uh, my brother was like, so they overpay fighters and uh, take money from billionaires and burn it. That sounds based. And then I realised, oh, actually, that is actually really cool. So good for Chantry. He, if he's doing it deliberately, he's running the coolest redistribution of wealth I've ever seen. All right, let's do a question before we get out of here for this week. Dear Slacky, I am an amateur MMA fighter based out of Hamilton, New Zealand. The local MMA scene here on our side of the pond can pretty much be summed up as city kickboxing versus everyone else. Local shows I go to and fight on usually have a CKB fighter in one corner, and more often than not, they win. I have two questions. Firstly, my coach Toby and I have often talked about what we think makes this gym so dominant like this, what we think makes a gym so dominant like this, in particular city kickboxing. If you had to pin it down to a couple of the most important factors, what do you... What would you say they are? My second question is, in regards to CKB's defensive wrestling and death by a, th- by a thousand feints type style, What is the most effective way to fight someone who is constantly hip and shoulder fainting? Given that it takes no energy and sets up all your offense, it seems like there's no drawbacks to it. Don't watch out for me in the coming years because I won't get to the UFC and definitely won't be the next Conor McGregor. Bless. From Ryan. Cheers, Ryan. Good question. Um, Now, honestly, on the local level, amateur level, regional level, I have not followed much city kickboxing. I know they're top fighters in the UFC uh, and not a lot outside that. And with, you know, within that, I would say that there's, uh, you know, Volkanovski is a city kickboxing fighter, but he also trains at a different gym a lot of the time to the main city kickboxing boys, I believe. At least that's what I got from one of their countdown shows, the UFCs, that is. But they've certainly hit on something effective there. And, you know, one of the common features of their fighters tends to be uh, an abundance of feints used very well. However, whenever you see a team take off, like, and, you know, there isn't a lot of talk of it in boxing because guys move around a lot and it's still much more of like an individual sport. There is there is something of a camp-based uh, mentality in MMA and that, not even mentality, that's how it plays out, you know, uh, because you're training with the same people all the time. And, and of course, boxing, you know, you need sparring partners like two, three days of the week. And you can go to another gym to find them. Whereas in MMA, guys are wrestling or grappling every day. So the team setup just sort of came to work like that. But when you have like the success of a team, I think some of it is to do with what their coaches are doing. You know, like you said, lots of feints in that team. And I think that's something that their striking coaches are really uh, devoting time to and, and hammering into the new fighters. But as much of it can be like they have a great strength and conditioning coach there or their workouts are insane. You know, they they do a lot of conditioning within their kickboxing sessions wrestling sessions so on but it's also worth noting that like people who are obsessed with fighting seek out the best they can you know there are the there's the odd people like um fedor you know did a lot of his stuff at home but even before that he wasn't fighting out of story oskal his entire life he went to was it moscow he was with the red devil team for ages you know um a lot of the time when you're coming up you have to find the best people to train with there are some guys who managed to do it from home like you know one of the amazing things about conor mcgregor is that he came from this small team in ireland where they were training in a shed for a lot of his career but that was still one of the top teams in ireland you know if you were an irish mma fighter there was a good chance that you'd end up in dublin at straight blast gym and the reason i bring this up is because the back in the 
days when I first started covering MMA, and before that even, Jackson Wink was seen as the answer to everyone's problems. It was like, so-and-so has lost two fights back to back. What should he do? It's either retire or go to Jackson Wink. But one of the reasons that Jackson Wink did so well, and they did come out of nowhere largely, you know, they, they got guys like Diego Sanchez and built them into great fighters. But uh, one of the reasons that they continued to thrive was that they just built this great roster of fighters. And a lot of fighters, when they were training for a hard, you know, a hard opponent or they'd had a bad loss or they were, you know, they wanted to do a particularly rigorous camp or something like that, they'd go to Jackson Wink and train there. And you had this amazing roster of fighters all bouncing off each other the entire time. Now, I don't know an awful lot about the New Zealand MMA scene, but I would guess that a lot of the guys there who want to make a, a, a serious future in professional fighting probably seek out city kickboxing as much for the uh, sparring partners and training partners as they do for any reputation that the city kickboxing style or their coaches have, you know? In fact, my, my experience with most pro fighters is that aren't they interested in training under a particular coach? They want to go and try what they already have against better sparring partners. Um, so I think that's probably why, you know, you've got the effect of city kickboxing becoming famous and then anyone who wants to be a good fighter in New Zealand is probably going to start gravitating towards there as well. So these things tend to, like, snowball. Now, that's not to say that they haven't developed some amazing fighters in, um, you know, Adesanya, Volkanovski, Hooker, uh, Kai Kara France, people like that. But if you're talking about like at the amateur level, then uh, of course, like they're just being around fighters like that is, is really going to help younger fighters coming up. Regarding like fainting as a, um, a tactic. Yeah, I mean, it, when you see someone do it well, it does feel almost like cheating. <laughs> when you're watching a guy decide to throw a hundred feints a minute and you're like, oh, come on, you know, if you're not going to just throw real punches, how do I know when to slip? <laughs> but um uh, that that's the thing of it you know it's supposed to feel unfair it's supposed to feel like well if I don't slip it might be real and he hits me and if I do I'm going to waste energy doing that and it's again it's another way to chew up distance too he does amazing work moving with his feints and so does Volkanovski because Volkanovski is a very short guy but he kept getting in on Max Holloway one of the ways he was doing it was fainting and coming in afterwards the other way he was doing it was low low kicking and using that to enter with punches we talked about how like the traditional low kick tends to work best once you're already in punching range, but the low, low kick is a good technique for getting you into punching range, which is why it's so weird that Jeremy Stevens has never actually managed to use it in that way. There we go. Hit my Jeremy Stevens. I was being too serious this episode, and I was like, I, what, I need to hit one of the classics. Ah, Jeremy Stevens, he's due. Slap, slap. Uh, <laughs> right. Cheers, Ryan. I'm going to head out for the, today. Uh, we'll be back later in the week. Got some stuff in the works. Doing a little thing on Bouchetcha. Uh, someone tell, tell Luke Thomas to oil up his hog ready, but uh, got that coming later in the week, a little filthy casuals quickie. But uh, this weekend we've got this Blades versus Volkov card, which, you know, not a bad main event, but just laying there just beneath the main event. You've got, on the co-main, you've got Josh Emmett versus Shane Burgos, and that could be a banger. you also got Lyman Good versus Bilal Mohammed, money. Uh, Jim Miller versus Ro Roosevelt Roberts. Roosevelt Roberts has, has done a quick turnaround. Um... And Jim are always, you know, fun for your money. Clay Guida versus Bobby Green on the undercard for people who like name value, but, but not particularly interesting fights. Um, yeah, that, honestly, that's not... Oh, Frank Camacho, yes. Uh, that's not a terrible card, considering last... Well, nothing's a t terrible card, considering the card we just had. But then after that, they just sorted Hooker versus Poirier for uh, June 27th. And then we're into UFC 251, where they quickly turned around three title fights. You know, two of them are kind of bollocks, and one is a rematch between Holloway and um, Volkanovski. But they, they're all good enough. So we'll be back later in the week to talk about the upcoming card, uh, and I'll probably do something for the Patreon boys in between. If you want to support the podcast, get in on the Patreon stuff, see all the cool shit we do for them, um, and just be uh, a bro generally. Sign up to the Patreon. If you want to send an email to the podcast, fights gone by podcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. I'm your boy Jack Slack. There we went, evil. There we went. Off, off.